I'd like for you to take God's word with me tonight and turn to the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to share with you something that the Lord has put on my heart over the last couple of days and come up in a couple of conversations, some late night conversations about God's word. And, and uh, this is a, a portion of scripture. The book of 1 Corinthians is a marvelous little book. It's a letter to one of those early churches. And what God has done in his goodness and in his sovereignty is he has given us letters that were written to early churches. In fact, first century churches. And in these letters, of the letter to the church at Rome, Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all Thessalonians, letters to early churches. And what he does in these letters is he deals with problems that were taking place then. And in dealing with those problems then, he also deals with problems throughout the ages. And here we are in 2021, and we still have the same problems as the early churches were experiencing. The church at Corinth was a very carnal church. It was not a church with much religious background. Whereas if you look at the church, churches of Galatia, they had more of a religious background because many of them were converted Jews. And so many of them had an understood uh, meaning of who God was and how God was to be revered and how God was to be worshipped. And so their problem in, in Galatia was they were dealing with, uh, you could say, legalism. They were dealing with people who grew up in faith. They grew up in some sort of a faith, some sort of religion. And uh, they were now adding to salvation because they were very strict, you could say. But the church at Corinth were a bunch of people who never had any faith until they met the Savior. And so they had a lot of baggage, if you know what I mean, when they came to the Savior. And so the church at Corinth was a very messy church. You had people who, who, who were very promiscuous in the past and are dealing with some of those troubles even then. You have people who did not understand reverence in regards to the things of, of God. And so Paul is trying to deal with several of these problems. And you could say, you could sum up this church, the character of this church in one word. We find it in chapter 3. Look at it with me, please. We're going to look at the first four verses tonight. And it's important to look at this because in every generation and in every church, you have this characteristic of a believer. And it's not a good one. And so we need to deal with it. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, you're still carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men, walk like everybody else? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Let's read a little further. Who then is Paul, and who then is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labors. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop there tonight. You could say the leading character trait of the Corinthian church was the characteristic of carnality. They were carnal. Carnal. That word literally comes from the word carne, flesh, speaking about 
rather than being spiritual, you're fleshly. Rather than being having eyes for spiritual things, you have eyes for selfish things, your own self. That's what it means to say you're carnal. You're more interested in yourself. And so I want to talk tonight with God's help at looking at some of the, some of the marks of being carnal and then how to get it right. Because I think God gives us both. And I wonder, before we go any further, are, are you a spiritual Christian or a carnal one? Some people don't believe you can be a carnal Christian, but these are clearly carnal Christians. In fact, Paul says in verse number one, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. They were Christians, babes in Christ. But the problem was that they should have been a lot further than they were. You know, just because you've been a Christian for 20 years doesn't mean that you're the kind of Christian you should be. Some people think that uh, they have seniority in Christianity. doesn't work like that. Some people have been Christians for 30 or 40 years, and they're no further on than a six-month-old Christian. So I wonder, are you spiritual or are you carnal? Let's look together. There are a few evidences of a carnal Christian. Here's the first one. A protracted infancy. You are a baby too long. Now, I've got six children, so I know what it is to have babies in the house. And uh, when, when babies are being spoon-fed and, and uh, we think it's cute, and uh, when they have to sit in a high chair and that's all lovely, and we have to change their clothes, that's all wonderful. But can you imagine if after five years I still have to feed them? I still have to change their clothes? You'd think something's not quite right. If they're the same size after five years and after 10 years, you'd say, this is not right. The child should be feeding themselves. The child should be changing themselves. The child should be able to walk. What's wrong? You would say there's something wrong. Well, the same thing happens in Christianity. People are brought under conviction by God's spirit. They're brought to a point of repentance where they repent of their sins and by faith look unto Jesus and by the spirit of God, they're brought from death unto life. They're born again, but very often, sometimes they never grow. And a year down the road, they're no further on in their understanding of God's Word. They're no further on in their walk with God. They know no more of God than they did a year ago. They haven't experienced any more of God's presence and God's love and God's leading than they did when they were first saved. And so this is the first sign of being a carnal Christian is that you're not growing. Can I ask you tonight, are you growing? Have you grown any more? Are you further along spiritually now than you were a year ago? Think about a baby. Some of the things that are normal with babies is they cannot help themselves. They have to be fed. Well, a mark of a carnal Christian is they cannot help themselves. And we expect that when somebody's first saved, don't we? When somebody is first saved, we expect that we've got to go have Bible studies with them and, we, and we've got to go and pick them up when they fall down. And we expect that. We expect that we've got to, say, we've got to warn them. No, 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 no. That's, that's, you don't want to listen to that preacher. He's a little bit mad, if you know what I mean. And we expect that. But as they grow, they should get beyond that point where you've got to spoon feed them every single week. They've learned to read God's Word themselves. They've learned to pray themselves. They've learned when a difficulty comes that... They don't have to call the pastor to get them out of the difficulty, but they've matured enough to know that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is enough. But if you're carnal, you will always need somebody to feed you, always need somebody to help you, always need somebody to clean up your mess. Not only that, but not only can a baby not feed himself, can't help himself, but a baby can't help anybody else. Do you know a sign of being carnal? is that you're not able to help anyone else spiritually. How can I help somebody else spiritually if I myself am a baby? You ever, had to try, you ever try to have a conversation with a baby? You don't get very far. Well, if you're an infant in Christ, if you're carnal and you're not growing as you should grow, then you won't have the words or the wisdom or the knowledge or the spiritual insight to help somebody the way that they need. And can I tell you something? There have been many carnal Christians who have done a lot of damage because they've tried to give spiritual insight to somebody and they were not ready to. I've seen it. I've seen it, I've seen it with my own eyes and heard about it 
with my own ears. Somebody trying to be spiritual and trying to be uh, somebody who is more advanced than they are. And they offer according to their wisdom some spiritual advice which is not according to God's word or according to the leading of his spirit. This is your first mark of being carnal. The second mark, look what it says. The first mark, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but unto carnal, even as unto babes. I fed you with milk, not with meat. Did you know, would you look here for a moment, there is some wonderful meat in this book. But some of us aren't ready for it yet. We're stuck on the milk. The author of Hebrews writes about this and says, look, you should have a long time ago, you should have been ready. You should have been ready to be teachers. And instead of being teachers, we've had to return. I had to go back to the, to the, to the, the early things and teach you again the, the principles. The Bible says in, verse, in chapter 5 of Hebrews, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say. Speaking of Jesus, we've got a lot of things to tell you about Jesus. And they're hard to be uttered. They're hard to say, seeing that ye are dull of hearing. Now, the author of Hebrews says, I've got some wonderful things I want to teach you. But I can't say it because you've got your fingers in your ears. You can't hear it. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. A sign of being carnal is that you can't handle the meat. You can't handle anymore. Your second sign of being carnal is found in verse number three. The word carnal is found four times in, in those four verses. The second sign of being carnal, look at verse number three. For ye are yet carnal. You're still carnal, he says. Hitherto, verse number two, he says, I, I, I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto, meaning up until now, you weren't able to bear meat, and neither yet now, you're, even now you're not able to bear meat, because for ye are yet, you're still carnal, for whereas there is among you, look at this, here's, here's the next sign that you're carnal, whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Do you know what the second mark of being carnal is? Sin and failure continuously. Now we all stumble and fall. None of us are perfect. But a mark of a carnal Christian is that you're falling into the same thing over and over and over and over again. No victory. He says there's envying and strife and divisions among you. I wonder tonight if any of those things are found in your life. Are you one that are constantly struggling with envying, being jealous over somebody else, and therefore strife? It's a pattern here. Envy, and then there's strife and tension, and then there's division. That's the way it usually works, isn't it? It begins with jealousy, that envying, longing. Maybe it's after a position. Maybe it's after uh, power. Maybe, I don't know what it is. And then after envying comes a strife. A bit of tension there, and then comes division. Shouldn't be amongst your Christians. You can almost hear it, can't you, when people talk? What's the first thing out of your mouth? Is it criticism? Is it an observation of a failure in somebody else? Is that what it is? Sin and failure continuously. As you grow and as we mature in Christ, we ought to get victory over these things. That doesn't mean you're going to be free from sin, because the Bible speaks about besetting sins, right? But he also tells us in the book of Hebrews, let us, let us lay them aside. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and trip us up. So there is a point, there is a possibility that you don't have to keep falling and falling and falling and falling over the same thing. Now, I, I emphasize again, you will still struggle. You will still fall. We'll talk about that in a moment. Look at the next thing. The Bible says, are ye not carnal and walk as other men? So in connection with this, a carnal believer 
has very little difference between their life and the life of the world. Now that is a shame. That is a shame because a Christian ought to be entirely different than somebody who's lost. We ought to live a life that is totally different. Nowhere in Scripture do you find a compromised kind of Christianity. That's a modern invention. It's a modern invention. Christianity is not to be one foot in the world, one foot in the church. Christianity has never, ever been a compromised faith. It's been one of commitment. And a state of being, a, a, a sign of being carnal is that you walk like other men. You walk like the world, you talk like the world, you act like the world, you respond like they do. That is a sign. Now, an interesting observation. Did you know that you can be carnal and still have a lot of gifts? And this is where people get confused. Do you know the Corinthians were very gifted, a gifted church? Let me prove it to you. Chapter 1, look at verse number 4 and 5. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. From the very beginning of the book, Paul says, you all are good talkers and you've got it down. You know theology. You read chapter 12 and chapter 14, they were extremely gifted people. In fact, this had to be written because they were abusing the gifts. So do not mistake gifts for spirituality. Do not look at yourself and say, well, hey, I'm a pretty good talker or I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm bold or I'm this, that, and the other. Do not mistake that for spirituality because this Corinthian church was very gifted, but they were also very carnal. There's a difference. Chapter 12 and 14 speak about the gifts, but can I tell you, the Corinthian church had gifts, but they didn't have the fruit of the Spirit. There's a difference. You can have gifts and not possess the fruit of the Spirit. You can preach a great sermon and not have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You can teach a great lesson and not have possessed the fruit, which is the evidence of the indwelling and fullness of God's Spirit within you. And this is oftentimes where people mistake, mistake their spirituality. One last little thought here about a sign of being carnal. Being carnal makes you unfit for receiving spiritual truth. Would you look here for a moment? If you can come into this tent or into a meeting or into a Bible study week after week and hear the word preached and never be changed by it, you might be carnal. Because you're not able to receive it. And it wouldn't matter, it wouldn't matter, it would not matter if Peter or Paul the Apostle Peter or the Apostle Paul were standing here today preaching, you still wouldn't get anything out of it because you're carnal. Because Paul himself says, look, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither are you yet able. You're not, you're still not able to get it. Some people go into a meeting and say, oh, I didn't get nothing out of that. You ever heard that before? Like it's the preacher's fault. Well, it might be my fault. It might be, but it might be yours. It might be because you're carnal. Because a carnal person cannot receive truth from God's word. You can't. There's a certain law, maybe you know what I'm talking about. There's a certain law where we name something or someone by the most prominent characteristic. For instance, you might say, that's the preacher with the big nose, if you know what I mean. That's the American preacher. That's this fellow, or that's this. We identify somebody with the most prominent characteristic. Well, the most prominent characteristic for the Corinthian church was carnality. They were the carnal church. What about you? How do we get from carnal to where we ought to be, spiritual? Is it possible? Yes, it is. A resounding yes, it is. And it begins... Well, how do we get from being carnal to spiritual? It begins by believing that there is a spiritual life to be lived here on this earth now. Yeah. Not when I get to heaven. Well, when I get to heaven, we'll all be perfect. I hear people say that as an excuse for their sin. 
Well, when we get to heaven, we'll all be perfect now, won't we? There's a spiritual life to be lived now. But you'll never have it if you don't believe it. If you don't believe that it's possible to be any different than you are right now, then you're never going to be any different. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18, listen to this. The scriptures tell us, Ephesians 5 verse 18, pardon me. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Do you know that God desires for you to be filled with His Spirit? Now, I believe that we receive God's Spirit when we're converted. But I do not believe you are necessarily walking in fullness of His Spirit. In fact, I know we're not. Because believe me, many days I've been walking after the flesh rather than the Spirit. This, this little analogy given here, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, is a comparison. When you're drunk with wine, you are no longer uh, in your right senses, as it were. You're under the control of something else. You speak differently, act differently. Your entire character changes. And so it is when you're filled with God's Spirit. You're no longer under your control, but you are yielded to His control. And so God desires for each one of us as his children. By the way, some people are afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. And they're afraid to talk about being filled with the Spirit of God. Because they're afraid of sounding like they're uh, some loony. Can I tell you, we're robbing the church. Because you cannot live the Spirit-filled Christian life without the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot live the way God wants you to live. How you've been saved to live if you avoid talking about the Holy Spirit. Or acknowledging his existence. He is God. Amen. He is God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And to deny his existence. And to act like he's not there. Grieves him. Amen. The scriptures tell us you can do several things to the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Spirit. You can quench the Spirit. You can lie to the Spirit. And you can resist him. Did you know that? I wonder how many times I've grieved him. Not knowing it. I wonder how many times I've quenched the Spirit. Quench means you put it out, as it were. If you quench your thirst, you put out your thirst, right? If you quench a fire, you put the fire out. How many times have I quenched the Spirit of God? Be filled with the Spirit. But do you believe it? Do you believe that God wants you to be filled, or do you think He only wanted the Ephesians to be filled? He only wanted the church at Ephesus to be filled with God, with His Spirit. Is that right? I hope you don't believe that. Because you will never live the way God intended you to live without the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22 tells us the fruit of the Spirit. That's the evidence of being filled with the Spirit of God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Now, I love this because Paul writes and says, this is the fruit singular. Not the fruits, plural, but the fruit singular. It's like a cluster of grapes. You say, those are grapes. The fruit of the Spirit. All these together are the evidence that God's Spirit is is not only indwelling you, but He is guiding you and leading you. Your life is filled under His control, under His direction. And if you've ever experienced that, you know there's nothing quite like it. And if you've ever experienced what it is to be filled with God's Spirit, you know when you're not. You know when you're living in a carnal state. Against such, there is no law. But we can only live that way by His Spirit. Think about it. We shouldn't just want to be filled with God's Spirit when we're preaching or when we're teaching or when we're going through some trial or some difficulty. Can you imagine? I really need you now. No, I need Him every moment. Every single moment so that when I come to that trial or when I come to that tragedy, this goes hand in hand with what we've been talking about on Sunday nights. God desires for a close, intimate walk with Him. That's what he desires. Romans chapter 5 and chapter 8 speaks very clearly about this. But in Romans 5, listen to this. 
And hope maketh not a shame. This is that following that little uh, pattern that being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now watch this. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, do you think God only wants to show his love with you when you, when you really need it? Fathers and mothers, if you have children, do you only want your children to think that, they love, that, they, that you love them only at certain times? Or do you want them to know it all the time? I believe God desires for us to know, to have the experience, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, every corner of our heart filled with his love. Knowing, not doubting his love, not wondering whether he loves us, but knowing it. That is wonderful evidence of being filled with his spirit. You know that he loves you. And you sense it. And then Romans 8 is such a beautiful chapter. I won't read the entirety of it, but it speaks about walking after the spirit rather than walking after the flesh. And you cannot live right unless you are being guided by his spirit. It's impossible. So your first step from going from carnal to spiritual is to recognize you can. You can, by God's grace, you can live a spiritual life. I believe the next step is an important one, is being able to admit, being able to admit you've been living in carnality. But we don't like that. I don't like to admit when I've been carnal. I don't like to say I have had an out, outward form of godliness, but I've been denying the power thereof. But I do not believe you're ever going to go from carnal to spiritual until you're willing to admit, yes, I've been wasting time living like a baby. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Acknowledge our shortcomings. Acknowledge our, it's my unfaithfulness, my unbelief, and my disobedience. Look, we know that a man is not converted unless he's been convicted of his sin, right? We know that nobody's brought from death unto life until they've been brought under conviction of their sin. But we need another conviction which brings us out of carnality and into spirituality. Are you willing to see that and admit it? You and I can never be a spiritual man until we're willing to be humbled and convicted of our carnality. Now think about this. I believe, Romans chapter 8, verse number 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. I believe that it's one step from carnality to to spirituality. I don't, I don't mean it's one step from carnality to spiritual maturity. That takes time, doesn't it? It takes time. But to go, to get out of carnality and into spirituality is one step. And there it is in Romans 8, verse 13. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live an utter breaking of the flesh, with the flesh. Do you know why so many of us live, live for a long time in carnality? It's because we love the flesh too much. We love the world too much. We love feeling this way too much. We love responding like this too much. But if we would, by the grace of God and by the Spirit of God, make one final sweep, cut it off, then we can live spiritually. You won't like this. It's a bit of a a cruel analogy, but there, I imagine it's a true story, knowing the folks from Georgia. But Georgia is the deep south in the United States of America, and if you know, they used to uh, cut the tails off of dogs, and Rottweilers and Doberman Pinchers and different kind of dogs. If you're an animal rights activist, don't take offense to this. I'm telling you what they used to do, so just calm down. But there was a man who said, I want, they call it docking the tail. It used to be doing in America, you dock it. There was a man who said, I want to I take that dog's tail off. And so he began the process. 
what he would do is he'd cut an inch off one week, let it heal up. As soon as it would heal, he'd cut another inch off. And a man friend came to him one day and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I didn't want to cut it all off at once. I didn't want it to hurt him too bad. And everybody says, you're a madman because if, it would be a whole lot less painful if you just cut it all off at once. And can I tell you, you'll never get to be where you need to be spiritually as long as you're just cutting a little bit off here and a little bit off there. I'll take this off first and get adjusted. Then take that off and get adjusted. Cut it off. Quit playing games. Cut it all off. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Paul writes to the Corinthian church in Corinthians chapter, Colossians, pardon me, the Colossian church at Colossae in chapter 3 and verse number 5. Listen to what he says here. Mortify therefore your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Can I tell you it's time to quit playing games and cut it off. Quit playing games and by God's grace and by His Spirit, ask God's Spirit to help you to cut off the flesh. Enough is enough. Quit playing games. Can you believe, I hope you will believe, that the spiritual life has been prepared for me by God and is a free gift. It's not something I earn. It's something that God has offered if I would only take it from a father that wants me to live spiritually, not carnally. Now there's a lot to be learned. Still a lot of imperfections. Still a lot that's not perfect. I don't believe at all that when you start living a spiritual life that you'll be perfect. I don't believe that. In fact, a sign that you are living a spiritual life is a sense of humility, is a sense of how you need him, a sense of your own inability, knowing that unless God helps you, you cannot do it. A lot to be learned, isn't it? But when that happens, instead of the predominant characteristic being carnality, the predominant characteristic will be spirituality. So I wonder, will you take that step? One step. Some people think it's a long process. Maturity is. Yes, sanctification is. But can I tell you, you are not maturing at all until you go from carnal to spiritual. You haven't even begun. You're not even in the process. You're not even allowing yourself to be conformed to the image of Christ because you're still carnal. And so what I'm talking about is just getting into that place where you can begin. And I want this church, myself, and the first of the queue, I want us to be spiritually minded. Not bickering and fussing and fighting like these Corinthians were. Envying and strife and divisions. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of this denomination. I'm of that denomination. I'm of this persuasion. No, no, no. Are you of Christ? Are you of Jesus? Is he first and foremost in your life? Are you following Him? Is He always before you? Is the love of God shed abroad in your heart? Go home and study Romans chapter 8 and let God speak to you through it. Romans chapter 6 speaks about yielding yourself to God. So tonight, if you recognize a bit of carnality, perhaps you ought to just yield yourself to Him. God, here am I. Please, change me. Bring me from out of this carnality into spirituality. Help me to see as you see and think as you think. Let, let yourself be grieved over your carnality. Don't stay there. Let yourself be grieved and by God's grace, by faith, take that step and begin to live a life following His Spirit. He's given it to you already. He's given you His Spirit. He's given Him to you. Do you believe that? He has given you His Spirit. So if you're not walking in the Spirit, it's your fault. May God help us. The church will only be what it ought to be as we walk 
in the spirit, not in the flesh. And you cannot walk in the spirit and still have divisions and strifes and envyings. Can't be done. The carnal mind is enmity against God because it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, and the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. So come on. Hallelujah. Quit living in carnality. And let's be spiritual. That's what he wants. Do you know the majority? Would you know what I mean if I said, the majority of Christians are living in a state of infancy. Would you know what I mean if I said that? The majority of professing believers are still babies. They should be walking on water by now, if you know what I mean. We should be taking steps of faith by now. Come on. May the Lord help us. Let's bow our heads in prayer, then we'll sing our final hymn here in just a moment. Father, by thy grace, reveal to us where we are today. If we have been stagnant for a while, show us, Lord, and help us out of it. We know, each one of us know, that in ourselves dwelleth no good thing, except thy Holy Spirit. And we thank thee that in mercy thou hast sent unto us the Spirit of the living God, to dwell inside of us, to lead us and to guide us, to convict us, to comfort us. Help us to start following him rather than ourselves, our own flesh. Forgive us for wasted time, Lord. Forgive us for the time that's been wasted following self. And now, help us to follow thee. Help us to take that step. Help us to believe that there is a walk to be walked, there is a deeper walk to be lived, a spirituality that could be granted to us if we would only mortify the deeds of the flesh by thy spirit. Help us, Lord. Help us, we pray. We are inadequate. We are unable. We are insufficient. But thou art all sufficient. Truly, Lord, thou art omnipotent. Help us, we pray. For we ask it in Christ Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.